Hey, hey, everyone. It's Sleepy Reader here. I'm trying something a little new. Um, shout out to Brian at uh, Infrared Media because I am trying out some software he mentioned to me. What's it called? OBS. I can't remember what that stands for. But it allows me to do multiple shots together. He did some fancy stuff that I can't figure out how he did that. But this is the best I can do at the moment. Um, <clears throat> we'll see if this is a technique I'll, I'll use more in the future. So uh, this is just uh, comic book thoughts, which I haven't done in a while. I'm gonna talk about five different comic books today. And um, some of them are for several weeks ago, many weeks ago. I wish I had been able to make more comic book videos in the past few weeks, but various things just kept me away from it. I was twice on Travis's round table comic book round table, which anyone's invited to. So um, keep that in mind if you ever watch that and you want to be on it. Um, you just have to contact Travis. Uh, we So we had two long sessions, I think uh, one this past weekend and then a couple weekends before that. So if you want to hear more of my comic book thoughts, that's one way to get them. Um, but anyway, I plan to, I hope to find time to keep doing uh, more comic book thoughts and maybe a number of them this way. We'll see how this goes. So uh, let me just shrink myself away so you can look at the comics and move myself over to the side. I can be even smaller, can't I? You don't need to see me that much. So that's tiny little me looking at the same comics you're looking at. Uh, let me talk about uh, Man and Superman first. This came out, I don't know how many weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. It was a 100-page special. It's really, I think, about 88 pages of comics. Plus, there's a really great introduction by Marv Wolfman explaining this whole thing and why it wasn't printed until now, because it goes back to 2006, 2008. And um, even the introduction alone, it was really fun to read. And although for me, it's not up there with, <clears throat> say, All-Star Superman by uh, Grant Morrison or um, some of the other most seminal Superman works, it's definitely, for me and now, like the top 10 of the favorite Superman stories I've read. Um, and one certainly the best I've read in a long time um, with New 52 and Rebirth and such. Uh, always ending up disappointing me a bit or eventually disappointing me. There was some, there was some very good stuff in Rebirth. Um, but this, uh, for I, I recommend this not for the non-Superman fan, but for the Superman fan, for people who love Superman. This is a great story, and it focuses almost entirely, or does focus entirely on when Superman, when Clark Kent first came to Metropolis and how he made the transition to Superman. And um, Marv Wolfman, at least in the, the mid 2000s, really still had, was a great talent in comics. Maybe this is one, he says it's his best Superman story. It's, it's definitely uh, one of his best works up there in my mind with his Teen Titans works and his, um, Dracula work, but of course very different from Dracula or Teen Titans and it's really the story of this extremely good person who happens to be an alien happens to have these superpowers It's also a great story about how he the the roots of why he would have fallen in love with Lois Lane the whole Lois and Clark relationship is set up so nicely here and I wish that there were comics that just continued on from this story forward. Um, we get almost no Superman in his costume, a lot of Superman flying around with these kind of lame disguises on him. Uh, later, he has a full stocking over his head. And we also kind of get the origin eventually of the whole conflict with Lex Luthor. And just everything to me was just perfectly set up in this. And, uh, I loved the art. The coloring's great by Hi-Fi. Who is Hi-Fi? What is Hi-Fi? Whoever Hi-Fi is, if it's a group of people, and it, they, an AI program, Hi-Fi does, does great. Um, 
So yeah, I'm just highly recommending this to anyone who's a Superman fan. It's basically, for whatever reason, it, it could have been a four-issue mini, but they decided to put it out all at once. I'm not sure the reasoning behind that. Uh, maybe they thought the market was too crowded with miniseries and that that would just confuse people about the continuity. And so maybe by putting it in this one-shot, kind of expensive, but worth it for what you get um, addition, that they sidestep anyone wondering, is this in continuity, etc. Um, the title Man and Superman goes very well. Yeah, so um, cause to celebrate for Superman fans. Another book I loved, completely different, <coughs> was issue two. I put in air quotes issue two because it's, um, there's been many, many other issues and graphic novels of criminal but they've started this ongoing which apparently part of the concept is they have the freedom here to tell non-consecutive stories to jump around to whatever criminal stories they want to tell so the last issue kind of was a cohesive single issue but really implied more story so i assume we'll get back to the story in that in issue two it's a completely different story a very good one about a uh, narrated by this this young man who used to be an art assistant to this older art older very famous comic book artist and it's like I guess some of these characters have appeared before in criminal I have not read all the volumes of criminal so I have yet to read previous episodes with these characters um, so uh, basically our character who turns out not to be involved in comics anymore is requested to kind of chauffeur around and, and be the minder for this older, eccentric, um, troublemaker artist, you know, living on his past fame, so to speak. <coughs> and he seems, and it takes place in 19, <coughs> was it 99 or thereabouts, back when the comic book industry was really in trouble. And, um, this character, uh, in the back matter, they say he's not based on anybody and that other than names mentioned in the background, no one in here is a real character. But this character has many, many characteristics that remind one of Gil Kane, including the famous story of Gil Kane stealing people's art at Marvel. And um, in fact, his name sounds kind of like Gil Kane. It's Hal Crane instead of Gil Kane. But he also has some characteristics that make me think of what little I know of Alex Toth because he's had some famous animation, animated, um, animated cartoons based on his work or based on work he did out there in the market. I don't know if Alex Toth also had any seedy things in his history about stealing people's art or doing other uh, repulsive things. You know, we have a scene where Hal Crane uh, offers a um, a cosplayer here, a Princess Leia cosplayer. He offers her $100 to go back to his hotel room with him. And he's, yeah, what, what? Of course, this is what these women are. And he doesn't under, he, he thinks back in the old days, apparently the uh, booth babes might also be people you could buy. I, <laughs> we're also prostitutes. I, I, even if they were models back then, which they might have been, I don't, anyway. Whatever. It's supposed to show what a sort of crass, out-of-tune kind of guy he is. And eventually the plot develops that, I mean, he's looking, he's scamming for ways to make money. He's, he's signing counterfeit animation cells and he's um, wanting to, he, he feels someone stole his art and he's wanting to get it back. And he's willing to take a violent means to do it. And eventually what, what we realize, so I, I'm spoiling all of this. Um, so skip ahead if you don't want spoilers on this. Sorry about that. But what we realize eventually is uh, he wants to steal back some art that was either given by him to his daughter or, or, or his daughter ripped him off for his artwork and sold it. So now he wants to steal that artwork back. And the reason he requested our um, our narrator as his minder or his guide for the weekend is because uh, he has some connections to to crime and to 
uh, rob- burglarizing houses, apparently. Um, there's mention of him having left comics and gone back into his father's business. And maybe his father is one of the criminal characters that we're used to seeing in these books. I have to say, in I loved the art here. And, um, you know, there's some differences between the new colorist, um, Phelps, uh, Jacob Phillips, sorry, the son of Sean Phillips, we all assume, uh, and the previous colorist, Brightweiser, from the earlier criminal or earlier Phillips and um, and uh, <laughs> my brain's now and Bru- Phillips and Brubaker have had uh, Brightweiser as their regular colorist for quite a while, and now they've switched to uh, Jacob. And I think Jacob's doing a really good job. So, like, I really liked things like this. Um, when there's not a detailed background, there's kind of a mood background. I just think the color and the art went together really well. It may not be at the level of Bright, may, not, may or may not be at the level of Brightweiser, but just taken by itself, this was really a great art, really great coloring. I've kind of been noticing a lot how um, Brubaker will do, not Brubaker, Phillips will do a thin outline around his characters, but then do lots of heavy inking inside the outline. And I, uh, at least when he does it, I find it a really compelling style. A lot of artists you see now just do thin lines and leave the rest up to the colorist. <clears throat> but in a way that the, um, that the uh, ink gives a lot of the lighting effects, it frees the color colorist up to do some other kinds of effects, some expressionism at times. And um, so I think the father and son are meshing very well. I kind of expect it to keep getting even better because I, f- I feel vaguely like I'm liking the... I didn't go back and look at the previous issue, but I'm liking the coloring even more in this issue than the previous one. And I like the coloring a lot on the graphic novel they did together. My favorite people are junkies or whatever. Um, that one had a totally different color scheme, a much brighter, sunnier, California kind of color scheme. So, and, and also for both Brubaker and Phillips, just the rhythm, there's just a, for me, a, a very compelling rhythm to these stories that they do together. And I've been uh, reading some sleeper, some stuff they did in the 90s together. And you can see the beginnings of this rhythm. It's not as sharp and on top of everything the way it is here. So just wandering our way through the day with this artist and his ex-assistant is fascinating um, because of the way it's told. There's as much, I mean, the story is a good story, but there's also greatness in the storytelling for me, the, the pacing and everything. And a magic for me that I'm only going to get in comics, even though this is not about your typical, you know, cliched American comic book story. But um, the other thing that I thought was very interesting was there's a little bit of, you know, whether you, there, there's a scene where, um, I keep wanting to call, call him Gil Kane, Hal Carver and, um, and the kid, He's not really a kid, but the younger fellow are talking about why he quit. And the younger fellow says, well, you told me to quit. You told me I was no good. And the older guy said, well, I never told you that. And if I did tell you that, I told you to toughen up. And it, it's just interesting, especially for someone like Brubaker, who seems a very successful guy in comics to kind of uh, meditate a little bit on the people who fall by the wayside, the people who don't make it, all the barriers in your way to be successful as a creator and all the things that can push you back. And I think I heard on a podcast or somewhere someone talking about maybe there's another story in Criminal later on in this character's life where he does go back to comics. Uh, I'm going to have to look for it. I I have so much to read, but I'm really dying to to dig into all the Criminal that I have not yet read. Also, to me, really unique in comics right now is this series, Gunning for the Hits. And I wasn't going to get it because I thought, you know, just music and comics don't usually mix that well. Uh, For me, I I don't get into comic books about music 
But David Lee and a few other people were saying some interesting things about it. So I went and grabbed these two issues. And the more I read them, the more I loved them. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it part of it is this feeling that the narrator, kind of like Brubaker, it's not, he's not as skilled yet, uh, the writer of this comic, as Brubaker is in a kind of meandering stories within stories kind of thing. But he does have that vibe. And I really enjoyed the sense we can have a scene here. And then our narrator can back up and say, hey, wait a minute, I'm going to give you a primer of my view of how the music industry worked in 1998 or whenever this takes place. <coughs> back before digital music ruined everything for the music business. Um, and we find out in the back matter that the writer does have a history working with Ryko Disc and working with some other record companies as an A&R man and, and doing other things. And he's worked in record stores and such. Now... I heard some people complaining that there was something anti-Semitic in this issue. And um, I looked and I looked, I couldn't find it. Finally, I found it. There's this little drawing here, one of the many steps that happens in what he describes uh, in the journey of a music deal being made. Um, he says, Erwin J. Seis J. Scheister, his fee also paid out of the band's advance. And we see this kind of snidely whiplash looking character. Now, I guess some people have felt that that's a cliche of a, um, of a Jewish lawyer. And uh, I'm half Jewish. That never occurred to me. I always thought shyster was a Yiddish New York type of term derogatory for a... <coughs> For a lawyer who's a con man, uh, the you know a lawyer who is not out for your best interests, or perhaps someone else who's out to cheat you, and um, and I don't know you know to me that cartoon's not particularly Jewish looking, but anyway I some people feel that way and uh, I would like to give the writer and artist here the benefit of the doubt and I I did um, look up on Wikipedia just. For the sake of argument, their description of shyster, um, and a shyster is a slang word for someone who acts in a disreputable, unethical, or unscrupulous way, especially in the practice of law, sometimes also politics or business. In the etymology, um, there's no agreed-on etymology. Different dictionaries say different derivations. Um, one might be from an old version of the word shy, meaning someone who's disreputable. Um, it might be based on the German word, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce it, sh scheisser. Um, some various false etymologies have suggested an anti-Semitic origin, possibly associated with the character of Shylock from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, but there's no clear evidence for this. One source asserts the term originated in Philadelphia from a disreputable attorney named Schuster or Schuster. Um, <clears throat> another book traces it to scammers in New York City who would pretend to be lawyers. And these scammers were disparagingly referred to as shishers or shitters. Um, there is a professional wrestler who calls himself Erwin R. Scheister. And here we have Erwin R. Scheister, which he shortens to IRS. So I was wrong in even thinking it was a Yiddish word. I guess that's one thing that's not there. Um, so I would say, to, I personally would say it seems unlikely that this is meant as an anti-Semitic uh, disparaging of of uh, Jewish lawyers. It is a disparaging of lawyers. And if you're sensitive to that, um, there's tons of uh, non-Jewish lawyers out there, believe me. So anyway, another amazing thing is this is art by Mortat, who I've seen in various DC comics. I've never seen his art like this. I think he does a great job. He seems to be born to, to draw something like this. And the, the colors are very effective. I really fell in love with this, with issue two, when we meet our lead character, 
who's the kind of a and successful a and r man and his crazy stock broker friend who is utterly immoral and in, almost insane and is such a fun character and made the whole suddenly made the whole thing remind me of like novels like bright lights big city and so what i'm really enjoying about this it's not totally a realistic portrayal of the music business it's definitely full of exaggerations and over the topness on purpose um there's a feeling of freedom to it that can go in various directions and uh, mix interesting narratives and interesting bits from the real world. There's kind of a, a David Bowie-like character. And apparently the, the writer of this at one point helped David Bowie uh, set up his deal with Ryko Discs. <coughs> and so there's enough verisimilitude about the music industry that brings out the music geek in me, you know, when I loved various different genres in the pop music world over the years. And, you know, back in the day when I would read The Village Voice and read Rolling Stone and various other things, trying to find out more information about the world of music and what the world of rock stars and everything. And it, it that makes it fun. And um, just the energy and the multitude of layers of storytelling are really fun. I know not, it's not for everybody, for sure. Um, I, think, I think it's something that may find its audience uh, in the bookstores and the like. The average person who would enjoy this is not searching in comic book stores for something like this because there isn't anything else like this in comic book stores. Although, to me, on some level, it does have, there is a spiritual connection between these, these two comics. <coughs> Excuse me. On the other hand, uh, Peter Cannon Thunderbolt is totally for us denizens of the comic book store. It um, Thunderbolt Peter Cannon is the inspiration for the character Ozymandias in Watchmen, and issue one kind of, in many ways, uh, is a takeoff on the end of Watchmen. We're getting the end of Watchmen happening in this world of Peter Cannon. And um, this is written by Kieran, uh, Kieran, Kieran Gillen, the author of Die and of uh, The Wicked and Divine. And so this is full of <coughs> Watchmen-esque stuff. This artist, Casper uh, Wingard, is not nearly up to Dave Gibbons. And, and that's a real weak point here. <clears throat> and I really don't like the style of coloring. I've seen better work by Casper Wingard on an image book he did a while back. Uh, his name is, it was one that took place in a dreamlike New Orleans. Um, I just can't remember the name of it right now. Uh, and, and he just doesn't, he feels stiff here. Like he's, he's holding back or he's struggling. It's, 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 uh, I don't know, feels very sort of carefully drawn and digital, but not, and not very detailed, just a not a satisfying art style. But he tells the story well enough in terms of, of that. It's almost like I wish he had an, a heavy-handed inker to go over him and give it more substance um, a sp and, and get rid of this colorist. But if you can get past that, it's a really, and you're a fan of Watchmen and comics books history and stuff, it's really fun. And in the second issue, I'm not totally sure where they're going with this, but it looks so. So kind of the main plot is there's this guy who's like Osmandius uh, Thunderbolt, the smartest man in the world. And he realized he immediately realizes when there's this alien attack that it's a fake alien attack meant to bring the countries together, like at the end of Watchmen. But the fake alien attack has been set up by a doppelganger of himself, another version of himself from another dimension who's somehow manipulating events at a distance in, in the original dimension. So we have, and that was revealed at the end of issue one. And so now we have um, them setting out to travel through dimensions somehow by creating this comic book grid. And then they focus somehow, and then they travel through dimensions. And we get this cool kind of meta 
meta comic book fictional scene where they travel through uh, dimensions by being in comic panels and looking at comic panels from other dimensions. Now you can either be really annoyed by this and there's part of me that wants to be like I want something more concrete and not just sort of a flaky it's all literary you know kind of I want a uh, an in-story explanation rather than an outside of a step outside and say hey it's all a comic book we can look through the panels but uh, once I accept that it's it's really cool these other characters around Peter Cannon have been developing more um, I can only wish, you know, the color doesn't look as bad in issue two. Is it the same colors, I wonder? But I can only wish the, um, the artist grows. I think he has the skill to be a, a really good comic book artist, but he needs to grow into the story a little more. He needs to loosen up a little bit or something. <clears throat> the only other negative side about this is it's published by Dynamite. So it's not as on as good paper as some of the other indie comics. And there's only 20 pages of story rather than 22 or 24, you know, like that. Um, the, these image books that I was just talking about, they are so chunky and high quality for, for the four bucks that you pay. But I'm really enjoying this and I, I can't wait to see where it goes. Finally, um, another one I'm really enjoying a lot. It's, this is issue four of five. So for most of you, unless you can find these uh, cheaply in back issue bins, I'd say get the trade. Um, again, it's not for everybody. It's there. Every issue has these incredible painted covers, and on the inside, a different style of art, but also very incredible. But first and foremost, I picked this up originally because I saw the art and the color. Um, the artist is Mateus Basla. The colorist is Rebecca Nalti. And they, they make an amazing team. And it, so I was attracted to the art and color. And, and it turned out to be a really cool story after also by a writer I'd never heard of before, Delilah S. Dawson, who turns out to be, I think, a, a young adult fantasy novelist. Um, and some, some of those people don't translate well to comics, but Delilah really does. Um, <clears throat> this is, in a sense, a young adult story. It's about a young teenager from, I think I've talked about it before, a young teenager from um, like what, the 1800s or the, the Jane Austen period or whatever. And her father brought her back. He had her with an African slave, brought her back to his English estate to be raised with the rest of his children and his very angry uh, British wife. Um, and then she gets sucked into this world of fairy and meets this kind of evil rabbit-like creature. Where is he? I'm trying to remember his name. It's been a while since I read this creature here, um, kind of like a jackalope or something, who constantly, who tells her he knows how to get her out back into her world so she can save her world from the fairy queen who's going to destroy it or turn it into her kingdom. Um, and does this sort of half African girl in, in Britain of the 1800s have a place back in her world, but she wants to go back and save her world. Um, but, but to do so, at least according to, you know, her, her rabbit like mentor, she has to do evil deed upon evil deed upon evil deed. And she's slowly transforming more and more into a creature of fairy herself. And this issue has a very powerful scene where the guardian of a bridge creates all these illusions that dig right into her psychology and the fact that maybe she doesn't have a place in her rather unjust world that she's trying to get back to. Um, and this was a very powerful issue. There's only one more issue to go. Um, in the end, she betrays, betrays someone she loves, supposedly by accident, but um, again, the rabbit-like mentor tells her there are no accidents. And so it's, it's, it's a... It's an, a unique kind of moral fable because it's all about morality and, and doing good to be doing bad t for a good reason. Or is there such a thing as that? And all of that sort of stuff, along with just a really cool kind of modern update <laughs> take on one of these, you know, fantasy worlds where you like like Alice in Wonderland or what have you, where you travel through this weird mirror world 
um, and, and slowly explore it and are changed by it as you go through it. And as you can see with just amazing art. So for anyone who, who likes a fable-like story like this, and if you find this art appealing, it, the story and art and color and everything really click. You know, it would be fun to find all the individual issues because of these awesome covers if you can, but it will, it'll be a great read in trade too. So, um, well, I'll have to see how this came out, if it, if it sounds okay and the picture looks okay. I think I went on much longer than planned. I, as, <laughs> no matter what I do, I always end up doing a longer video than planned. I, I limited myself to five different comics and thought I could do something briefer. But I'll be back with five other comics, uh, hopefully pretty soon. So uh, great talking to you all. See you later.